Um, so I'm going to call on Gloria Matera. She's the co-chair of the New York State Green Party. She's also a member of System Change, Not Climate Change Coalition, and she's run for office as a Green Party candidate several times. Uh, thanks, everyone. I want to uh, acknowledge Steve Bloom from, from Solidarity for uh, keeping this effort going and actually getting it to happen. We've been talking about it for many months, so thank you, Steve, from behind the scenes. Um, uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, Socialist Alternatives, uh, you know, electoral successes um, and victory. It was really encouraging, really exciting to be able to follow the campaign. It's great. Um, and and I, I guess what I want to acknowledge is just last weekend, a group of us, about 20, 30 people, came together. Um, kind of the main individuals are trying to build this coalition called System Change, Not Climate Change. Uh, we're having this meeting. There was a very successful meeting. I understand the Brecht Forum last week where uh, socialist alternatives and other socialist groups talked about uh, electoral campaigns and, and other things. And I just want to say it's really important that we're all in the room together talking. Uh, and besides that, we're actually out in the street working together and doing things. And that, I think, is going to be uh, what's going to make the future in New York City and other places um, possibly very different than it's been before for all of us. So. Um, a round of applause for all of us that are doing this work together. Uh, <laughs> Given the kind of questions that came out on the flyer, they were pretty um, overwhelming and big. Uh, I will just say a little bit about de Blasio. If, uh, Bill, in my four campaigns as a Green Party candidate, Bill was my opponent in two of those. I ran against him in city council in 2001 and 2003. Uh, those stories are much more interesting over a beer that we can talk about some other time. But um, I, I think we have to, what we said to say about de Blasio is, you know, he really was, as a candidate, the big change from, you know, the Bloomberg years, right, and for people. Um, and very different, right? You know, his personality is different, his look is different, his family constellation is different, he comes off as an accessible person. Um, you know, he, he kind of rode that little change wave in the way Obama did. And, you know, what we have to say to ourselves is, you know, in, in 2008, there was no dissing of Obama that went very far outside of our, our groups um, and our kind of in, people doing independent politics and alternatives. It was really hard to have conversations with people, and it continued to be. Now, a lot of that kind of has changed. Uh, second, you know, second term, second administration, uh, a lot of progressive people are really disappointed. Um, Obama's done things, you know, worse than probably some people expected. Um, I think there'll be a little bit of that with de Blasio. I don't think de Blasio is kind of maybe in the same machine way, and obviously it's a more local level. Um, but what we have to think about is he's saying things that really appeal to those long-term grassroots organizations that fight for the rights of people in New York City. Whether we think they're fighting the right way, it's the housing and the tenant groups and the anti-poverty groups and the anti-hunger groups. And so they're really optimistic. And so there's this kind of, the good side is there's this optimistic, upbeat mood that maybe those services aren't gonna continue to be cut back. Maybe more is gonna be put into that. But then you look at, well, what's with the pre-K fight? Um, why is it something that is not in de Blasio's power? That, why is that the mandate, he actually says, from the people who elected him? He can't get tax increase without the governor, and then, so I don't want to waste time on, on what, how that debate's playing out, but it's interesting that what he's galvanizing people around is a demand that he has no power over, when he has power over many other things that he's not yet talking about. So it's just something for us to think about, for us to look at. Is that a good strategy? Um, is that a way to rally people around? Because we often talk about things that we, you know, people will say, oh, you'll never get that. Um, or is it one of those smoke screens, which is, it'll end up being Cuomo's fault that this couldn't happen. Um, and to dig in his heels and say, I'm not doing it any other way. So I, I think that's something for us to pay attention to, figure out how we might talk to people about those things. Um, moving away from that, I mean, what do we expect? What do we expect from the new mayor of the city council? Not a lot. Um, but in terms of electoral politics, what do we do? Do we challenge uh, that? Absolutely. We do it, I think, in a very tactical and coordinated way. We have four years until the next citywide election, city council elections. It feels like a long time. 
but it, it goes quickly. And we know that the parties with the money, backed by corporations, they are making their plans four years, eight years in advance. We never seem to do that. The Green Party often decides, oh, we'll run a candidate, and it's, it's just about the election year. Um, that's not because we take it lightly, it's because it requires so many resources um, and, and so much effort to do that. Um, now, I think the, the Sawan campaign shows a lot um, of good lessons for us, building first, running for office, building again, doing those kinds of things. I think that um, maybe it was Nick that said it. When we want to talk about tactics, New York City is very different. And I think that one thing we can do, especially those of us who are in organizations that are placed in some of the major cities, whether it's Green Party chapters or ISO chapters, socialist alternative chapters, that where does it make sense to run and what does it mean to run? If you don't know the electoral law, if you don't know what you need to do two years from now to run a credible city council race, then we're just a protest campaign. And I think after Seattle, I think in fact, the victories in Ohio are even more impressive because that's Labor saying, you screwed us and you're not screwing us again because that's what's happening everywhere and that's what people take notice of, that working people are getting screwed. Um, and that, I think, was an amazing victory to see. And so whether we decide we're gonna run Green Party candidates or openly socialist candidates, I will say that Howie and I were the, on the ticket together in 2010. He was obviously lieutenant governor candidate, and although, um, as they say um, in the old language, the banner wasn't raised that high, um, we were mostly known that Howie and I were both socialists. Um, so we were a socialist uh, you know, pair on the Green Party. Uh, Howie's running again um, for governor, and I think that's tremendous. I appreciate Alan's plug, because I would like people to come and talk to me later about how to get involved in that. Um, and so tactically, which we can talk more about, the Green Party has a ballot line in me. Um, and that is really one of the only ways you can run a candidate with some ease in the electoral system that we have here. And that doesn't mean I would say we should not run an independent socialist or whatever other kind of left candidate um, throughout New York City, because there are a lot of spaces to do that. But what we really want to talk about at some point, whether it's this meeting or a group that forms after, is what tactically can we do? The Green Party has a ballot line. We need to keep that ballot line. And that ballot line is valuable. There's nothing in the Green Party program that says a candidate cannot say, I'm proud to be a socialist. Maybe that hasn't happened very often, but that's something we really should all talk about. We have been, uh, you know, we've always worked very closely with the ISO in terms of doing the real on the ground electoral work. Uh, we'd like to bring those skills um, and that knowledge to other groups of people. And of course, what we think is most important is if, those of us who are successful and comfortable organizing in communities, in those, those movements where the housing people and the anti-poverty people and the anti-hunger people are wondering what de Blasio's administration is going to do for them, if we're working in those movements, really those at some point need to be our candidates. So we have four years. We have two years to see who in those movements, the stop and frisk movement, the anti-racist, who in those movements are people who would be wonderful to stand up, stand up the way Salon did and give a wonderful inaugural speech like she did to be to talk about those kinds of things, whether they say they're socialist or not, but to talk about what we think are, you know, whatever, the transitional program, what we think is a, you know, a living wage, people's health care, uh, safety. The climate change umbrella is a big umbrella to talk about things when it has the face of the post-Sandy devastation in the Rockaways and in Coney Island, which continued on and on and on and on while other neighborhoods are focused. Does any, in some ways, it seemed laughable to be focusing on the fact that de Blasio, you know, to blame de Blasio that they didn't plow the Upper East Side first. Um, you know, but is that the kind of thing that, that they like to plant? Is that a story to kind of divert our attention to what the real problems are? Reporters trying to think about how are we gonna ask the question five different ways about snow removal? Um, you know, that really makes me feel like there's a lot of things we can talk to people about and say there's a lot of things that they're trying to change your direction and where you're looking so you're not paying attention to what's really being done. Kind of end on, um, so I hope the discussion will be around how we might plan and if something comes out of this more long lasting around both organizing locally and looking for local candidates, training local candidates. Um, it's, you know, this Bloomberg created a city of luxury 
wife, um, whether the new administration of city council is going to make changes in that. I don't know. It's not so easy to be able to reverse those kinds of things. But basically, still, uh, the sense of the Democratic Party here is the party that's basically, you know, working with real estate developers, um, supporting, it's often initiating the rezoning which allowed that to happen. You know, there'll be communities we cannot change anymore unless there's something really audacious that's going to happen in city government because they basically, people have been zoned out um, and phased out of their neighborhoods and that's not easy to bring back. You know, one example, um, we want to point to people, the Blasio says 20% now of affordable housing is going to be a mandatory thing as opposed to an optional thing for developers. But that means 80% is still luxury housing. That's a lot of damn luxury housing when people are homeless at record rates right now. Um, and that 20% affordable housing is still based on your midtown income, not in Brooklyn, not in the Bronx. So I think there's a lot of juice for us to talk to people about in a very real way. Uh, I'm looking forward to working with uh, the organizations and the individuals here. Uh, and that is my time. Thank you.